what I did today. What? What did you? What did you do? You have you? Did you start drinking early again? Yeah, I did. I drank a Red Bull, see a 12 ouncer, and I drank one of these Seattle's Best Ice Latte. These are good. I like mm. those. So that's good. You know, All, that's as powerful as alcohol. Certainly gives me as no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love those five-hour energy. Where do you stand on the five-hour energy drink? Do you believe those? I don't know. Uh, I I I almost got one today because I see them. You know, every <laughs> every time I'm checking out, I think I've got to try one of those. It's and because sure. you're in marketing, you're an easy sell. You're yes, a mark. I know. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Actually, I know I'm an easier sale than than if I wasn't in marketing, that probably. Is, but that is the truth. Yeah, and they've got all these flavors, and uh, I don't know what to make of it. You know, I what I'm told is it's sort of the combination. Well, actually, I I, I hear people say different things. I went online. I went to their website. I, I'm like, what? Well, okay, because somebody said, oh, there's no uh, stimulants. It's just B vitamins. Well, that's not true. There's you know, their their claim is that it's no more than, you know, a strong cup of coffee. That's true for caffeine, but I think it also has taurine. I think guarana, maybe just taurine. And there was one or two other like herbal stimulants and then a bunch of B vitamins. So, which I don't know that that makes it much different than a Red Bull. No, you know? I don't think it does. Yeah. Hey, do you know what I own now? What? A pair of glasses. Ah, oh. I <laughs> I bought the one times magnification old dude glasses. I actually look really smart in them. Totally. And that's the lowest, you know. I mean, that's the. But wait, a minute. one times isn't that like if you times it by one, it's the I same thing, right? Aren't you just I like? <laughs> I didn't ask anybody. I don't know the math isn't on that, it. There's no man. It was different than without. <laughs> I sat in the drugstore and I was like, okay, on, with on with without. With, without. Okay. The one, the 1. 1.25. The 1. 1.5. Without. With, without. I, I did, it, it was at least, well, a good 20 minutes of testing. I didn't ask anybody because as a man, I'm you'd not going to do that. Of course, yeah. you'd be shamed. So I just did my own in-store testing and I thought, eh, it's good. Yep, that's better. Okay. Dane, I think you may have an actual vision problem. I think that might I think be the case. I think these magnification glasses that, uh, really are just treating a symptom, which is you uh, being it, a little bit daft. It might be. But but I I really think if I hold up my one times magnification glasses, that really I'm just looking at normal things through glass. Huh? I, I don't I don't think I'm actually kidding. I don't know how that works. Why do they even sell that? Just for people who would like to walk in the rain, they should wear goggles. It's well, the same it, stuff, right? Is it, are his stuff actually bigger? Okay, here I got them right here. I'm gonna put them on. All right. And indeed, something's happening. I if I is if it I something keep, in your eyes? Yeah. Here's the okay, deal. That's good. It only I, I can only wear these to look at things that are really close to my face. If I look anywhere else, I start to get like seasick, carsick, whatever. Yeah. Things start to get a little warbly. Yeah. I so I got is they call that short sightedness? Is that what they call well, that? That's that's uh that's what I would call you. I yeah, think it's their talking like, is nearsightedness. Nearsighted. Oh yeah. Short sighted is going is you're different. going, yeah, okay. It's sort of a <laughs> uh -huh. right. It's just when you set I'm those, e I'm an easy target. You set them up like that. You're wearing your old man glasses. Oh yeah. Well, I know. Well, I, I know. I I've just <laughs> sort of made myself a bigger target by admitting any weakness at all well it's not that much bigger i would say maybe it's a one x bigger target <laughs> well you wait i don't know i might i might be able to read the footnotes and, and know more things now you should know more stuff what you do know, you want to talk about today? read contracts now um i have a couple of questions first of all why uh why do i keep i'm so baffled by the frequency in the past, I don't know what, five days or four days or whatever, of links to falling model at the New York uh, Fashion Week. Uh, maybe it's not, <laughs> I know that's, you know, whatever. It's, it's, it's on Huffington Post and it's on a bunch of news sites. I was checking the Salt Lake Tribune's website. It's, it's on there as a, an AP story link. You go to like NBC uh, dot com. There's a there's I've seen the links all over the place, and they've got this poor girl in this really long dress, and the shot, the little thumbnail to get you to watch the story, is a picture of her falling, and you know her left breast is pretty much popping out. 
Yeah. It seems like that might be one of the biggest news stories of the week. What since when did models falling become such a popular link item? What I don't know, it, but when you have search you it? when you search Google, it's it's like uh, they they it's definitely a, big, uh, a meme. I don't know. I don't know. I, I get they're like baby birds. I hope they're little <laughs> Their wee hollow bones don't snap. I think that's what we're we're waiting for. I just saw it one too many times this morning. I thought, I, okay, it's been several days that somebody's trying to tempt me to click on a story that is nothing more than a woman on a catwalk falling. And I yeah. I swear I've seen it like 15, 20 times this week. That that's you know some uh, some thumbnail or whatever, some link to you got to see this story. You got to see this story. Anyway, I didn't know if you'd been bothered by it either. I just thought, okay, that's enough times today that I'm feeling like, wow, I'm the news is making me dumber. I guess. I mean, what what is this? Can I can I tell you something? I I may be one of those people uh, who is operating inside the filter bubble. You know what the filter? You you know about the filter bubble? You got like your all top filter, and that's your news source, or what? No, not even all top. It's I just I, I just. Okay, so I just did a search. I, you know, it's one of those things. I'm using Chrome, and so I went into the Unibar, the super Uber bar, and I just typed Huffington Space Post. And I meant to type Huffington Post, but I typed Huffington Space Post. I don't like the Huffington Post, really. It's kind of a lame. System, I'm getting, you know, so. yeah. Um, so, so after what I, that AOL thing, it yeah. got far worse almost well, instantly. So what I did was I noticed that Huffington Post did not show up in my search results. At all. No, it, it was all news about Huffington Post, but no HuffingtonPost.com links. You. Well, what I realized, this is my tip. This is my tip. I forgot that I had actually manually blocked sites from my Google search results because they are annoying. And you can do that. You go into, if you're logged in to, to one of your Google properties, do you know about this, that you can manually no. block sites? Okay. So you go, you click the little gear when you're on Google. So you go to google.com and you're signed in. So, you you know, make sure you're signed into like mail or Google plus or something. And you, uh, you can click the little gear in the top right corner and go to search settings. Are you doing this? Are you following along? No. You're not. You're not. God, see, I'm speaking slowly because I think that you're following no, along. No, you're, it's fine. You're quiet. I, I'm going to go back and listen to the podcast. You should do that because this is good. this so, is the kind of thing that, uh, yeah. It's, I'm know. dropping. I am officially dropping a knowledge bomb on you right now. <laughs> but and I'm not, so what you can end I up do doing. This from you do Safari? It, uh, yeah. You, can you do it? For, yeah, you could do it from Safari. Do it right now. Click on the little gear. So, I use Chrome for uh, AdWords. And so, okay. <laughs> So here I am in Safari. All right. Let's start all over. Go to Google.com. Got it. And do you I'm see the little gear? You see the little gear in the top right. Click on it. And go to search settings. Oh, why am I not seeing a gear in the top right? I'm logged in as me. Are you at Google.com? Yeah. Where's the gear? Search to, and do you see the black bar? You know? So, oh, you know what it is? I'll bet you have the new Google bar. I don't have it. Click on the Google logo, the little drop down, and go and see if there's a search settings there. I I'm still on the old style, oh, okay. lame. They haven't updated me because I'm I don't know why. It's not the more. I don't know. It's a search settings. You want to go to advanced like search settings, whatever that is. I'm gonna I gotta log out mm. and log in as my uh, as my other account so I can actually see what you're doing. It's uh, interesting. Sign. In, so I'm signing in with just a straight up Gmail account. Oh, uh, okay. So account settings or profile? What do you think? Hold on. I clicked my image of myself. No, that's not it. Well, there's a drop down says profile, Google Plus, account settings, and privacy. Okay, so you're on search, or I'm on search, and I'm searching. F I'm going to search for uh, monkeys. And so I've just searched for monkeys, and now there is a gear right below the picture oh, of me. Oh, it has to be on a search result. Okay, search settings. There we go. Click on that. Okay, now now that everybody's okay. caught up, now scroll down to... Oh, so this uh, is how I protect my kids. Blocking unwanted sites. And there's a little link there. You can click on it. And then you can manually block a site. And so I typed in 
uh, HTTP colon slash slash HuffingtonPost.com. And the reason for blocking was because uh, Ariana is annoying. No, you don't have to say that. You don't have to make personal jibes. She's not annoying. She's actually very pleasant. But the but site is annoying. is annoying. There's always news about her on her post. Always news about, well, it's, I mean, it's her personal blog. Now, wait a minute. Where I, I'm not, I see safe, safe search filters, Google instant predictions, results per page, personal results. Where, where result results open, blocking unwanted sites. I didn't get that as an option. <gasps> what? I didn't. Why? Does it say use personal results? Is that checked? I wonder if that. Ch oh, let's see. No, yeah, it says use personal anything. results. Where results open? Google wow. Things. You don't no, have. I, it's yeah. I have my list says where results open, and below that, web history. Fascinating. I don't get the option you have. Why? And Why you it? you're signed in as a straight up Gmail account. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't troubleshoot this for you, man. I don't know why I'll that figure is. It out. <laughs> you should figure it out. But, well, but I know it's, where to figure it it's out. It's really, at. really great uh, when that happens because you end up in this, uh, you know, being able to totally um, filter <laughs> the the you know the, the out the sort of bad news sources that you aren't crazy about, and uh, I find that really, uh, really useful. Well, I see. I have yet to. Uh, personalize google news results or uh my all top page you know like i i i uh oh what else? i guess you could probably even personalize having to post couldn't you if you wanted to there's i think you could do that i i just haven't haven't <laughs> haven't like spent the time to really modify those things in any way so you know i just i guess i get the same sort of I don't know why, 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 why do I get the results I get? But anyway, um, yeah, well, so you've, you've smarted up your news search results and you're not seeing this. I don't see how many posts. I don't see business insider. I, uh, when I do Google search, I only see, I'm, I'm starting to filter so that I, I get more of the primary sources that Huffington post and business insider rip off. Uh, huh. and, and so, and I usually find that the original content that ends up on one of those sources, I'm finding from the authors themselves. And I think that's a really interesting shift that I'm, I'm finding the authors that I really like. I'm following them already on Twitter and Facebook and uh, Google plus, and they tell me there as, you know, because I filter them in on those sources, if there's a specific author and usually they're writing from more than one place. Uh, and so, uh, I end up with, um, you know, with a good mix, but I, but my search results are not contaminated by link bait sites. Well, and that's, that's useful. You know, to me. well, there's something important about that because there have been a couple of like let's say health related stories where there's you know there's information that's say important health related information, and they've crunched it down to a short story with maybe a couple of salacious points. And then you're kind of you have to reread it and think now, whoa, what did it just say? And then you read a couple of comments and people are like, uh, everyone's got a different opinion. And then you think, well, no, hold on. And you go to to an original source, and all of a sudden it makes perfect sense. The the data is there, uh, it, and in the translation of uh, this is where I find this most often, or at least I notice it most often. It's like a health-related news story. It's crunched into a place like uh, Huffington Post, or I've even seen this on USA Today or some other sites, um, that if you don't get the original story, somebody is making some real, um, what's the word, compromises in the way that they're uh, trying to, to crunch it down to something sort of short and sweet with lots of other links. Yeah, yeah, totally. Anyway, yeah. so. All right. All right, All right. so, that's, so the, there we go. that's the first thing. Uh, what was the next on your uh, list of things to talk about? A couple about? of things. Now, I got an invite yeah. f for you from you for PATH. Let's talk about that. Now, I, I remember you not liking PATH, and I thought, well, I'm not yep. sure. And I, hadn't, I haven't started using PATH or anything. And then I hear a story that PATH is uh, a big, is is sort of, what was it, the tip of the iceberg of this problem people found on Apple of uh, um, address book sharing. So then I wondered, and I thought, well, I'll just ask him on the show, did he mean to send me an invite or did something happen here with this path uh, problem? No, I'm going to be honest with you. I meant to send you that invite because I figured I, okay. who who better 
to put at risk than my friend's name. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, right? So kind. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, so Path. I uh, Path is a is another yet another social network, uh, and it's built around this uh, app ecosystem on the iPhone. And it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful application. It really is a, uh, a wonderfully elegant application. I think you you know a lot of the design sort of hints that came in Facebook's timeline implementation sort of came from from a lot of what Path is doing. I, I think that it's gorgeous. And one of the, I, I think there exists a loophole, a, a rift in the space time continuum uh, between Apple and developers for connecting people based on address books. So the problem is Path is a social network and it needs, if you want to make connections between you and your friends, Path needs to have some algorithm in order to make those connections. And so, uh, you know, what they do is they take your address book and they just upload it to your uh, to their server and they run the algorithm on it, matching people in your address book with people that are already members of Path, right? And this was discovered by an enterprising developer uh, and or an enterprising user developer who said, "Wow, I didn't know that this new version of Path was actually uploading my entire address book to the server. That doesn't seem like a good thing." And suddenly there's there's great uproar. And now, of course, Congress is sending letters to Apple and to Path saying, you know, why do you do this? You you know, everybody's overreacting, running around their heads cut off. I would say, um, well, since then, since this has happened, other application uh, developers have come out and said, you know, we do this too. Uh, you know, Twitter is one of them. Twitter is uh, uh, sort of the bigger dog in this hunt that actually takes your address book and uploads it and then, you know, downloads back to you uh, your results. It's the same thing like iTunes does with iTunes Match and your genius stuff. I mean, it takes all of your music habits and uploads it to Apple server, runs its little mojo on it and gives you the results back in your application on your computer. That's the interaction with the cloud that is happening. And, and, because it was not explicitly um, described as an opt-in in the application, people are freaking out about it. But that's what's going on in the background. Twitter and Path are not alone. It's happening. Is it? And so the real question is: Is it something to fear? And I don't know. Do you fear it? <laughs> I mean, I, wait, do I, you have a problem up? Is that why you didn't respond to me? No, no. It's actually or is not. it because you're a tool? No. I mean, I don't know. You don't no, like social networking. I wasn't sure that. It, that because it was of me. comments made about Path before, I thought, yeah. and then I just didn't get around to it. And I thought, okay, I, I don't, I want to take the time if I'm going to respond to this, and I, I, I can, like I have thought, I've, I've sort of gotten myself to the point of setting up uh, into Path at one point, but I didn't follow through, and and uh, I, I kind of need to reorganize, you know, how I'm doing that kind of sharing anyway. So I thought, well, I want to do a little research and, you know, whatever. And then the story came out, and I thought, well, we'll talk about it on the show because I'm not sure. Um, anyway, well, I I, um, th I guess, Pete, um, there are sources I trust and sources I don't trust, and maybe I'm naive, but when Twitter does that and when Path does that or, or another approved uh, app that doesn't concern me, um, I haven't been terribly concerned in the past. I'm nervous about it. Like I'm not completely uh, oblivious. I know that iTunes pulls, you know, uh, my music uh, habits and and uh, collection, and um, that doesn't bother me. It, the first I thought about it the first time because I thought, you know, that's a this is a pretty. Um, I mean, if you're looking at the entirety of my music collection, there are a lot of different sources that music came from. It didn't all come from iTunes, and some of it are CDs I owned, and some of it, you know, CDs I borrowed, and um, a few tracks I got from a Russian website about five years ago. And, you know, um, so I thought, I don't know. I, I mean, do I trust that they're not, you, you know, I mean, you got a couple of weird MP3 uh file names, you know, or, or are they flagging me or something? Like the first time I wondered, I did, you know what I mean? For a brief moment, I thought, I don't know, this is sharing a lot of information with a big company who has, you know, a, an interest in media um, uh, pirating and, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, I, I lost my concern well, there. And, and well, there are two I, things going on. First of all, I want to apps. I, I, I have almost completely uh, not uh, accepted or or adopted Facebook apps because of that 
hey, if you say okay, it's yeah. gonna it's gonna upload everything to this app, and I just say no. Well, I, I, there are a few apps that I find really worth it, and so that that really I think is the big question, right? I, uh, uh, two points of clarification: the developer who discovered this, his name is uh, Arun Thampi uh, from Singapore, and so just so the name is right, and I don't look like sort of a wandering nomad of information. So the the real issue is Dave Morin is a CEO of Path, and I have been following Dave, and I follow what he writes elsewhere, and I have a certain uh, sort of uh, trust relationship of Dave because I know what he stands for based on you know what he's done in the past. Many people don't have that that sort of um, information relationship with Dave. I follow Dave's work, so I kind of know what he stands for. And therefore, I have greater trust in the organization that the organization is not out to do something malicious with my data. Right. Now, right. The, so, so which, I, which doesn't – I mean, there's another part to that, which is as much as you trust them, uh, you know, there, there still may or may not be security breaches within that company that are the, no fault of that company's, and that's just part of the world we live in. But, you know – Exactly. You, you would, but that's the, that's the punchline, right, is that there are uh, – is, is they uh, – whether or not I have that trust relationship, right – whether or not I'm personally worried that that they're going to use my data, you know, maliciously, what I know is they have my entire address book, and they may not intend to do, you know, to use it incorrectly. But things happen, you know, mm-hmm. things get broken. And what Dave has uh, has since come out and said is, you know, we did, th- we thought we were doing it the right way. His quote in a Wired article just this morning, I, you're so timely, you're very timely. Oh, good. Uh, is uh, you know, we thought we were doing this the right way. It turns out we made a mistake. Um, it is, uh, you know, they, they've acknowledged that there are some of the things that, uh, um, that you know, PATH does that just wouldn't work if they didn't have this sort of connection data. Um, you know, the further quote, we don't want to connect you with just anyone on PATH. Without the contact list information, some of these features uh, just won't work. Uh, so the, the irony is of this whole thing is that Path is a service that exists, which we've talked about on the show before. It exists to connect you with your very closest friends. There is a 150 right. connection limit now. so Which it used to be 50. It used to be 50, and, and clearly 50 was not quite the right. Uh, right number, uh, you know, 150, you know, may or may not be right. I'm finding I don't use the service at all. I, I, I tried it. I try to have it open. I put it on my home screen. I set notifications. I friended a bunch of my, my closer sort of you know, more technically oriented uh, hipster friends. Uh, some of them responded. You did not. <laughs> um, and, and, and I'm finding like I get the exact same information on path that I do on the other networks that I'm on Facebook, Foursquare, Twitter. I mean, all these uh, everybody that I know who is interested in using path is also technically oriented enough to cross post to all of these different services. And so I'm not getting the benefit out of well, it as well designed as it is. It's kind of a useless tool for me. And that's where I have to always, you know, I mean, if I go after, if I chase every next interesting little um, whatever, social connection or or, yeah. uh, or app or whatever, I'm pretty soon, you know, uh, an example maybe, let's say I'm, I'm trying to use three different productivity tools at once. Well, <laughs> that's going to make me the most unproductive person in the yeah. world. Yeah. I, it, it has to be simple. And, uh, and so like you're saying, you know, uh, there are ways, of course, to sort of interconnect some of these things and, and keep your logins to one place. And I, I just, it's hard for me to do multiple things. But there's something also, speaking timely, uh, that I wanted to, to, to uh, mention really quickly, and I think it sort of parlays here, is the, the latest story on Mac rumors. So you may have, may or may not, I guess, know about this. This is the first time I've heard of it. But they're uh, kind of releasing more details about uh, Apple's new OS X release for later this summer called Mountain Lion. And there's some features. I guess there's one that's in beta now, uh, Messages, which combines iChat with uh, uh, with their Messenger and a couple, I don't know, what else? iChat and FaceTime. And it sort of does away with iChat eventually. And Well, here's, yeah, some- here's hoping. I mean, when you look at the Messages app on the iPad and iOS, you, you see where, where Messages on the Mac is going. 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah, you do. Uh, and some other things. But here's the one I wanted to, to, to point out here. Um, Gatekeeper. Have you heard of Gatekeeper? I have. Yeah. I, so Gatekeeper. So describe what Gatekeeper does. Well, from my understanding, it's it's almost like, a, a in a way, a low-tech approach, in a way, um, to virus protection and, and maybe even some other um, privacy protection, I guess. But uh, Gatekeeper essentially says to you, uh, let's say you're a new Mac user, I, you know, whatever, and, uh, and you decide to, first of all, download uh, apps um, or applications from the App Store. Well, what you know, um, f I guess, uh, as we move forward with Apple here, is that they've pre-approved the people on the App Store so that if anything is sort of nefarious at any point with their software, they can kick them out of the Apple App, app Store. And, you know, you, you as a consumer have a level of trust that if you bought it from the App Store, they've been approved. So that it, they're sort of giving you, uh, I don't know, they're, they're sort of giving it a... a the fact that you're in this closed environment, they're giving a bonus too, so that you know you're you're happy to be in a closed environment. But the other thing is, if developers aren't in the app store, or choose not to be, or uh, have their own method of of uh, uh, you know, you go to their website to download an app or whatever, or buy it somewhere, that um, developer has the option to go to Apple and say, "Will you approve us?" Uh, and I don't know what. Anyway, you know, we would like be registered with you so that, again, if anything happens down the line, um, they've got an, uh, an ability to sort of check against that developer, this app that you're trying to load, and you have a different level of permissions to say, are you really okay? Or, you know, um, these guys have been approved. I don't know quite what the screens are going to look like. But anyway, they're trying to just basically say, look, if you sell software, for the Mac OS uh, operating system, then um, then uh, you know you you want to kind of be in the circle of trust. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's. I, I mean, I think that gets it. It's the it's the fact that you know while you still have this anywhere option that you can install software from anywhere, meaning you get it on a DVD, you get it on a you know a, a flash disk, somebody gives it to you at a conference, you can still have a selection in security and privacy that says I want to be able to install applications from anywhere. But uh, the other two options are the options that are going to allow Apple to have that extra degree of monitoring of your system that says, you know, I'm, I only want to install uh, software that, that is digitally signed. And what that digital sign uh, signature means is not necessarily that Apple is actively scanning the software, but it says that the developer has gone through and agreed that when they develop applications, they're doing it under Apple's new, more rigorous terms of, of service for development, that they're using Apple's um, security and design guidelines, not maybe not design guidelines, but security guidelines for actually releasing a, an app. And uh, I think by default, uh, the option is going to be set for Mac App Store and identified developers. So you will be able to install software from anywhere as long as the developer that you're buying software from is, you know, is a proven and digitally signed Apple, you know, Mac developer. Um, I think that's a good thing. I think it, you know, I haven't had had a chance, like you said, I mean, all this news just came out this morning, and there is a bigger marketing issue that I want to talk about, or PR issue I want to talk about uh, in a second. But but technically, I think it's it, it really is an effort to make uh, to make being secure and no, and having apps that abide by these sort of vetted guidelines uh, easier and uh, to implement on the users. Well, and, and 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 Apple's had this competitive advantage for a long time that you can, you know, you can kind of tell somebody, hey, you know, that virus plagued uh, PC that you've been running for five years now, um, that you really. You, you know, can't even get the viruses off at this point. Go to a Mac, and the chance of you getting viruses goes way down. It does. It has, you know, from in my experience, and and you know, but there's still no guarantee there. Um, there are some built-in reasons that uh, it, it, there are a couple. Um, you know that it's much more difficult for you to get a virus on on your Mac, but it's not impossible by any means. Um, this, I guess, another layer of uh, you know trust and and. Um, uh, keeping, keeping the bad stuff out. And it sort of, you know, it's sort of, 
I just found it a little bit interesting that, you know, from a congressional standpoint, they're saying, hey, Apple, did you know that this was going on? Did you know that you've, you have approved people to be in your app store that um, customers didn't know that this, you know, this level of data sharing was happening? You need to be on top of that. Um, well, that's a, fr- you know, this is a frustrating kind of a, a thing because, you know, the... Uh, I don't know. I, I, yeah, obviously, we weren't in the room when these decisions were made about how the address book is going to to interoperate. But what it sounds like to me is, at some point, um, there became a general assumption that contact data was not the same level of security as, say, password data or you know something like that. I you know, and so uh, what they're saying now is that. Uh, contact data is going to require that same level of explicit user approval for as the system requires for okay. asking for passwords. And that was, it, it, it was, huh. of course, that's going to be the response. It will be fixed. It will sure. be fixed. Seems like an easy, yeah. Quickly and decisively. And it will be fixed long before Congress gets a chance to read the letters of response. I mean, that's well, the most well, frustrating part is it will change things for developers. I mean, uh, in, uh, Marco Arman from Instapaper has already released a, an update just this morning changing the way uh, contact data is, is uh, you know, synced securely and encrypted sync to um, you know, to the server for doing that same sort of sharing, I, this will be fixed. It, it seems like not a well, huge issue. So, and I don't want to say that everybody's awesome and everybody's, you know, above board and, and no one should worry. And this is, you know, but I still think at the end of the day, you, you've got um, something that already exists here where, you know, Path, for instance, is available in the App Store and Congress is available to say, or is able to say, hey, Apple, you approved them. They're in this closed yeah. environment. Where on the other side with the Android, it's still just this wide open, wild west of, of apps, right? Uh, so, you know, who, who do they go to there then and say, hey, whoa, 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 someone's got to be in control of this. Well, that's, uh, I, I think, is a really interesting thing is, is uh, you know, and, uh, from the Android perspective, when you see, uh, it'll be interesting to see over time how the Amazon Android store works out because, you know, what what Amazon is really marketing is, you know, you have this, you have apps and we're creating a gated kind of, uh, you know, we would like to create this sort of gated secure experience that Android just generally doesn't have. Uh, and so it turns out the security becomes a differentiator in Android app stores. I, I, you know, I don't use Android, so there's a whole lot I don't know about that ecosystem. Um, uh, yeah, and I don't, and there's nothing for me to complain about there. I just think it's sort of interesting that, you know, and there's all, and we've talked about this before in the show, but you know, there's always this comparison to, gee, you know, Apple really lost uh, market share when they kept this closed um, program and and software. Um, uh, environment or whatever and and windows let it explode and and look how they dominated um and then you know here we are again with mobile devices and you have one that's sort of a closed network and another that's not and i just think there are things about the world that have changed in a way that um i'm not so sure i just to date anyway uh, i know there's been complaints over the past whatever couple years that that apple has this um totally subjective ability supposedly anyway to say yes or no to apps and people say you know uh, that's not freedom but they have a better user experience and users have more trust in the in the app uh i don't know in the apps that they that they use and that apple approves so i don't know just seems to me like it isn't as paralleled as as one might think on the surface. Well, I think that's the that that's a, a great way to look at it. I I the, are you burdened by the amount of security that Apple puts in the in the App Store? I as yet am not, and and I think when you look at the App Store on the Mac, you know, I, I it'll be really interesting to see what happens when Gatekeeper goes in line. Right. And in, in addition to you know you you mentioned Gatekeeper, one of the other big features that's coming in Mountain Line this summer is going to be. Um, robust integration of iCloud services. And that becomes a feature that is only available to developers if they are uh, distributing their software through the App Store. You are more than welcome to uh, go ahead and release your app uh, you know, in on your own and get a digitally signed app, but you can't use the, uh, the uh, implementation for iCloud for your app in, unless it is distributed through the app store that will change 
the the app ecosystem yet again. I think because uh, there are still It'll a lot of apps. Interesting to see because you know, and... it forks apps. It forks. It lets you go and buy an app from a developer's website that is functionally different from the App Store version, and that's it... something we haven't seen quite as much of yet. And it's, I think it's, you know, open, fair game, I think, for, for arguing and debate. I mean, I, I've shared some opinions that I think are just my personal opinions about what I'm, you, you know, think is okay or, or that I'm not bothered by or whatever. But other people, you know, more than uh, welcome to completely disagree with that. And some of that, from what you just said, there will be... Um, the, some, some For some people, there's a principle at stake there that, it, you know, I mean, Apple is making decisions that really are business decisions. Some people will see them as almost heretical, you know, um, ideological. Ide ideological. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see how it plays out. You know, uh, so I'm really interested though, uh, from, yeah, man, we've been talking about geek stuff so much that I'm, I, I think we we may have missed the, the PR story, which is actually how Apple released the news of this of mountain lion did you catch how this no. worked no i didn't no this is fascinating uh, so usually when they do these big you know these big you know os releases uh typically they're they're enough for a press event right you know when they when they get out there and they they haul out phil schiller and they do a a keynote at, at you know the apple on-site kind of pr theater or you know if it's part of a bigger event um you know they used to do it at Macworld. Uh, and so, you know, now they're not part of Macworld. The bigger events, they, they um, you know, they save for some of these bigger product events. And so what they ended up doing was they, they invited uh, journalists, it turns out, to one-on-one -on -one press events with Phil Schiller and some folks from product development and PR. Oh, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. Go to, uh, th this is, a, you know, I read all the all the other sort of news-related stuff, but if you go to daringfireball.net, John Gruber is one of the um, one of the pundits who actually got one of the invitations. He was flown out, or he was, he was taken out to um, uh, Manhattan to sit in a, uh, well, I'll just read you this, this bit. Uh, we're starting to do some things differently, Phil Schiller said to me. We were sitting in a comfortable hotel suite in Manhattan just over a week ago. I'd been summoned a few days earlier by Apple PR with the offer of a private product briefing. I had no idea heading into the meeting what it was about. I had no idea it would be how it would be conducted. This was new territory for me and I think for Apple. Handshakes, a few pleasantries, good hot coffee, and then, well, then I got an Apple press event just for one. Keynote slides that would have looked perfect had they been projected on stage at Moscone West or the Yerba Buena Center, but instead were shown on a big iMac on a coffee table in front of us. A presentation that started out with uh, started with the day's focus. We wanted you here today to talk about OS X and a review of the Mac's success over the past few years. 5.2 million Macs sold last quarter, 23, soon to be 24 consecutive courses, uh, quarters of sales growth exceeding the overall PC industry. Tremendous uptake among Mac users of the Mac App Store and the rapid adoption of Lion, and then the reveal. Mac OS 10, sorry, OS 10, is going to be an iOS-esque one major update per year development schedule. This year's update is scheduled for release this summer and is ready now for developer's preview release. Its name is Mountain Lion. And his post is long. It is a significant uh, write that covers just about uh, as much of the technical detail of, uh, that was included in that press event as it was um, of the experience of getting the full press event treatment from Apple for an audience of just himself. And it's fascinating. And and I wish John Gruber would go a little wider on his, um, his text area. Cause that's what long. you're complaining about. Oh no, it is really long. It's a, it's long. So, you know, go to Instapaper or something. Like that. It's, <laughs> Good. it's Good. Oh, or use what I never use. Actually, it's not available here. I was going to say use reader. I always forget to use reader yeah. on Safari. It's such an awesome little thing, but anyway, so not available here. That's a fascinating. So thing, that's the way that really it. fascinating. Who what else other, does that? Who else could do it? Well, I mean, I guess more companies could probably do it than than do it. But this is totally new. To do this one off, you get this intimate session with Phil Schiller, well, well, and then they handed him obviously stuff. they handed him a MacBook Air with Mountain Lion on it, and said, "Go use it for a week." And so he says he's been using it for a week. He talks about that experience, which is fascinating. Well, and there are a couple of things here that that are. Um, I mean, this is fascinating because we, you know, I think we're all somewhat 
um, aware of the history of Apple's big events like you were mentioning and, and how this is a new thing. There's also, I think, an important point that uh, those events weren't run by, um, I don't know, head of sales or whatever, the Northwest Division something or other. They generally um, involved Steve Jobs himself or you know, a very small group of C-level uh, people who, you know, Phil Schiller and, and uh, um, uh, the new CEO, I always forget his name. It's kind of a boring name because he's kind of a boring guy. But um, so what's his name? The, uh, Tim <laughs> Cook. Tim Cook. Yeah. yeah. I just, it's just a name I forget. It's a boring constantly. name. Uh, anyway. Uh, so again, you know, this is a, a new approach, this very intimate one-on-one -on -one thing, but it's, again, not done by whatever, head of a yeah. division or um, – not that that's a bad thing. I mean, well, maybe those Schiller people are in the is, room, but you – know, Phil you know, Schiller is – I think is a senior VP. or He's not a chief marketing. I think he's a senior VP of marketing. Well, he has a history of, yeah, being – He does those events. Yeah. These events, you know. it's uh, So they're taking the time. So these are busy guys with lots going on. So I, first of all, was just going to say, I don't know a lot of companies where it's that top core, maybe three people who are the ones who do this, you know, this press communication, whether it's the big event or now this one-on-one -on -one thing. But the other thing, so I want to mention is, you know, if we're looking for comparisons, it's, you know, maybe what's GM and Ford and I don't know, just some other big companies um, uh, that, you know, Dell, HP, et cetera. But they they do product briefings. Let's get that. I mean, I, I don't want this, this to sound like these companies don't do hotel room product briefings. They absolutely do. Uh, but. Well, where I was going to go with yeah. it is, it, you know, so you think this through and think, well, this is really kind of illuminating here. This is. Um, and we see, of course, how a guy like John Gruber shares this information through yeah. a non-traditional, you know, um, more of a, you know, a blog and some. Obviously, there's probably a lot, a lot of other social um, tentacles here to his communication, and so it plays into that because it's again, it's not just um, an article being written. There's a lot of information that came from that time spent. Um, so, uh, but so, but let's think though of companies that are maybe not all the way local, but you know, let's say you're in Portland and your client is um, a major hotel, right? And you have been brainstorming uh, for uh, months uh, about some events or some, you know, s new products or or um, specials or whatever. You just are, you're trying to get press attention. And not long ago, you would do a press release and you would, you know, you'd send it out and and maybe you would do a press. Maybe you would try for a press event or maybe you would invite uh, a journalist or two. Is there anything about this that would change that scenario? I mean, is there anything about the way PR works today? And maybe this doesn't illuminate anything to that level, but if you've got a client in a local area and you're trying to get both traditional and non-traditional press, is there anything different you would do today than you would have done six years ago or five years ago? Well, I think what we're seeing with this Apple experience is that, um, that there is a sort of new coming requirement for intimacy between the writers and the organization. Um, and, and I, you know, I just two days ago, I did a Google Hangouts uh, training session for a, a, a press agency in Orlando. Uh, and I thought, you know, I mean, we we did this because their pitch was we, you know, exactly that. We know that we need to help our clients develop a new level of intimacy with their, uh, you know, with their, uh, the people who write about their products. And so we really think that that doing this through, that Google Hangouts might be a, a really interesting way to do it. And we need to know how to get this done better. So they came to me and said, can you walk us through how, how people are using this and how we could actually go create, uh, you know, these intimate sort of hangouts uh, where we can put decision makers, product development people in real time in the same virtual room as, uh, uh, you know, as the people who are writing about the products, the, the key bloggers, key journalists, uh, all at the same time to have, and, and, the, the experience that they were talking about, which I think was so powerful, was this one of momentum, which was we don't we no longer need to wait for a giant event 
to have one of these hangouts. We no longer need to wait for a convention to make one of these announcements. If we have something to say, we can say it now, and we can do it more frequently and have a greater sustained impact with our message by, you know, by doing these shorter, more frequent messages using these these tools. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, uh, and and I think that's one of the things that we're seeing, and that's one of the things when you see Apple pull out years ago of MacWorld, the big conference. You see Microsoft pulling out of CES uh, this year, being their last year at CES. Um, these companies are realizing we don't have to to do things that way anymore. Uh, and this is an example of Apple saying, you know, we can put on a great presentation and we can have an in- that same impeccable impact that we have, uh, you know, from unboxing one of your new, your new MacBook Airs or iPads to uh, actually sitting down face to face in a hotel room. Well, and let's take this again to, to the local companies. So um, or the smaller company, I guess, um, small to midsize, which I assume is kind of the, the target of of. Uh, um, the the sort of brainstorming you were involved in, um, what what how is what you just said then in terms of advice or in terms of what they'd said you know hey we can you know we can trickle out this information or whatever we you know we can keep a sustained communication through other tools is is it or is it not different than a company saying hey we've got a we've got a news release page on our website uh, if we want to get some news out we put it on there. Yeah, nobody reads those things. Okay, nobody, so I just, nobody I just reads those things. I just want to make sure we've clarified. I, yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I, I don't. I, How much effort's required here? Oh well, it's it it's. I, I guess the the real challenge then, and and the challenge that this you know this agency came up with, uh, which which I thought was particularly astute, was uh, this issue of of more robust and rigorous media training for more people. I mean, if you're going to be putting product development people in front of, um, you know, in front of key journalists and writers who are expert at, you know, getting the words they want to print out of your mouth, um, you got to really, I mean, it, it's a special kind of training for guys like Phil Schiller, um, you know, to make them expert, polished and professional in these sorts of environments with people who are really good at, you know, twisting and, and, um, yeah, spinning. twisting words, spinning. And so, you know, the, the comment from this agency representative was, you know, we, we're going to have to get our clients better at putting their faces in front of the media. But the flip side of that is the media's expectation is now to see more faces from the company, to see more, uh, you know, to see more people who are who are able to talk more fluidly about, um, you know, about what they're doing with their products. And I think that's, uh, you know, press releases are sort of table stakes. Obviously, you're going to have a product announcement on your website. You're going to have a news release on your website. The next step is, and the expectation then is, when are you going to schedule a video uh, press conference? When are you going to invite us to your facility to talk more about this? Because the press release doesn't answer all the questions, and we want to have a unique experience, uh, you know, a unique sort of more intimate relationship with your company. That, I think, is the trend. There you go. Don't, I mean, you there know. you go. No, and that's, you know, I, I, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but I, I found this, or I, not mentioned it, but sent it to you. Um, let me see if I still have it open. And if I haven't sent it to you, I will. But I found a very interesting graph. Um, oh, there it is. The content marketing explosion infographic. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that? No, uh, you know, I've heard, I think I heard somebody, <laughs> I think I heard a content marketer uh, <laughs> retweeting it. Well, it's right. It's it's pro it's, it's content those... marketing from content marketers, but so I don't know where, where all the data comes it? from. Where, where is it? Where can I find it? Uh, you know what? I'm just going to send it to you because it I, it's kind of from uh, it's from Holy Caw actually. That's where oh, I found yeah. it anyway. So I will send it to you now. Um, I don't know what the actual origin is. Um, but yeah, content marketing on the rise, according to a 2011 study by. Okay, here's where the data comes from, the Content Marketing Institute. Content marketing is one of the top growing fields with an increasing number number of marketers relying on content strategy for overall success or success, sorry. Um, <laughs> although, although that may be more appropriate. Oh yeah, I have seen it. Okay. So the going. most popular content marketing tactics, uh, article posting, social media, excluding blogs, blogs, e-newsletters, case studies, 
in-person events. Yeah. I, I think um, you could maybe break down a little bit more. I, you know, for me, this is, it's always, or has been anyway, a moving target to say content marketing. It's, you know, you can, can maybe you define it this way and maybe this person defines it this way. What is it really? Is it, you know, the content on your website? Is it just um, up-to-date information um, dissemination? Is it how much of it is images and videos and podcasts versus the written uh, word? You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I, you know, I, I think, Content marketing is a is a um, I don't know. To me, it's a it's a little bit of a misnomer, and I think what is required, uh, you know, more of the discussion is is a, a newer piece to the vernacular, which is content strategy, and mm-hmm. and it's this idea of saying, you know, we have we know and we have developed an expertise over the last you know two decades uh, of saying that the the best performing. Uh, you know, and by when I say performing, I, I mean the best. Uh, what generates the best response uh, is good content. It's not link bait. It's not you know. Uh, you know it's not good head. It, it's not just good headlines. It's knowing that we are creating content that is relevant and intended for our specific audience. We want them to learn something and take action based on what they learn. And and the strategy comes in which pieces of content, whether it's an article or a piece of video or scheduling an event on a Google Hangout, is most appropriate for what channel. And, you know, we know that the message deteriorates in, in impact when it is just automatically cross-posted across each channel. At the same time, we also know that that content, that there are people who only go, you know, see us because our pieces show up in their Facebook stream because they aren't on Twitter. And by, you know, in converse, we know that there are people who just don't like Facebook. They only find us on Twitter, and so somehow we have to mitigate those experiences, and uh, and and so I think that's what we're seeing. I think we're you know, and and this new um, level of kind of intimacy when you're seeing this this growth in Google Hangout shows, um, you, you know, we're seeing more companies sort of take that by the horns and say we we want to be in this playground. We want to have that real time. I think that's the message: real time uh, investment with our brands. Well, in some uh, brands, and if we go back to maybe uh, shows that, um, what, over a year ago, uh, we for a time focused on a few brands that were only, uh, their their entire marketing strategy was a content, could be, I guess, termed a content strategy. So yeah, yeah. Evernote, um, uh, Hootsuite, I believe you could say that sure. still about. Um, sure. Uh, I, I guess a lot of newer um, digital or, or online uh, companies that really didn't have a history of uh, a larger, more traditional uh, marketing budget or marketing infrastructure, um, marketing director, et cetera. So they were doing sort of community directors or um, lots of different names were used for it. Uh, and over the time, over time, you know, bigger brands or, or companies that have that infrastructure you know, trying to find a way not only to adopt these strategies, but to, and this is where I think we still have a lot of room to uh, grow or or evolve, integrate the right departments together so that, you know, your IT guy isn't in charge of um, your web content uh, or maybe, or even really your analytics or your paid search campaigns, you know, um, but your IT and your your sales and your, um, uh, your marketing uh and your senior management, you know, have the right level of communication and interaction to make it an actual strategic uh, success instead of, uh, you know, piecemeal experiments. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's, I think that's true. I think it gets, I think what you're, what you're describing is that same thing that this, this Orlando agency was describing, that idea of momentum in whatever content you're creating. I well, don't know. And- and, and uh, okay, so amen. Um, is that is that it? That's the that's, that's the end. You don't want to say it. those words again in a different no, order. No, I don't. Um, <laughs> I wanted. I I know you have to go in a minute, and yeah. I wanted to uh, ask you one last question. I want to make sure I, I'm cutting it off just because I want to get to this question. I want to make sure it gets answered. I noticed uh, a post uh, from you about Pinterest. Yeah, and I want to know just a little. I mean, how do I get in and why do I want to get in? 
Wow, if Pinterest has, oh God, that's that, uh, uh, it's going to require more <laughs> more talky talky because I, I man, I was blown away by that. Okay, so can we? Could you make a note that we need to talk more about Pinterest next week? Okay, because uh, I'm going to have. How do I get in this. in the meantime, and then we can Holy both talk smokes. about it next time? All right, well, I'll see. I, don't I don't you know. invite me? Isn't it a closed network I of think sorts? It sort of is, right? You have to like request an invite or something. I, let me see if I can. I can invite you. I can invite friends. I don't have much on there. Uh, what's okay? So I know your email address. You, you want me to do the it's the Mac one? All right, I'll I'll, I'll work that out. So the um, Pinterest is f- fascinating. You know who who uh, actually chewed me out about this? I I logged into Pinterest like when I first got an invite. It was a long time ago, and I gave it about three and a half minutes. And I thought, oh, uh, look, it's like uh, 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 scrapbookers, and I. That's Stop. I've seen the website and that's was my initial impression. Yeah. All it was right. It's kind of a female thing. It's it's a lot of women <laughs> okay. are on this network. There is no <laughs> doubt a lot of and it is it is you know, it's sort of like a visual Evernote. Um if if you look at it that way. It, but uh, and so you you know, it's really good for images and as a photographer I'm very interested in that. But it's also uh, you know, what it does is it allows you to create these uh, sort of subject area boards. And then with a little bookmarklet, you're browsing along on the web and you see, you say to yourself, wow, that's a, that's a photo of a place I would like to visit one day. And you hit your little bookmarklet and it pops up a little box. It says, pin it. And you can write yourself a little note and, and save that to a specific board. And, and what I'm finding is, that when I post something, uh, a, a piece of my own content, man, do people act on it quickly. I see people repinning and sharing the stuff that I share okay. really fast. So I think what we're seeing is just a huge uh, – the, the ecosystem of activity is still very novel on Pinterest. I don't know how it's going to sort of meet out over time, but right now when I post my own stuff, I'm seeing people act on it very quickly it is it surfaces to the you know it surfaces itself in other people's streams uh very quickly through their through their search ecosystem and you can see you know uh, you can then follow other pinners and i don't have very many people following me right now and yet i'm getting people act on on you know and share my stuff pretty quickly and that's that's uh, i think pretty impactful it was megan uh strand who uh, poked me into it. She, you know, she gave me a lot of trouble uh, that I hadn't given it enough consideration, and and I think she was right. I mean, there's, there's, there's something here, and I think if we just, well, I've I've heard I've I've seen one or two posts by women about it, getting excited about it, uh, <laughs> you know, like ah, oh, I got, yeah, I got in, whatever. Finally, like it's this, you know, elite thing. I was like, what is that? And I looked at the homepage, and I thought. Okay, I, I, it looks really interesting. Looks, but looks pretty, you know, female dominant. So then I saw your post. And I thought, no, okay, wait a minute. What's what really is going on here? So I, I think I, I have a sense about yeah, one of this. But you, you have to play with we'll play with it this week and see what you think. And we should talk about it again next week. I, you know, a lot of the there are issues around kind of reposting other people's work and copyright and. Um, it it ends up being a uh, you know worth talking about because I think there are, there are interesting things uh, going on with Pinterest um, and you know I just sent you an invite so so check it out and then we'll talk about it in a more substantive matter. Sounds good. Next week uh, we got to I got to say the things. Oh, you know what? I'm going to post a link on. Uh, I, I want to close with this. I got I've got commandments to read. Um, and where did I get this? I got this from Lists of Note, and I'll post the link. It's it's from Henry Miller on writing, uh, and oh, I, wow. this is this is uh, I I just think this is this is Eleven Commandments. Henry Miller, great author of uh, Tropic of Cancer, great uh, lech and drunk Parisian. Uh, not he was not Parisian, but he lived in Paris for a long time. And if you haven't seen uh, what was it? Uh, uh, what Henry was that and book? June? Henry and June. Fantastic book. Uh, uh, so here are his commandments. Work on one thing at a time until finished. Number two, start no more new books. Add no more new material to Black Spring. Don't be nervous. Work calmly, joyously, recklessly on whatever is in hand. 
Work according to program and not according to mood. Stop at the appointed time. When you can't create, you can work. Cement a little every day rather than add new fertilizers. Keep human, see people, go places, drink if you feel like it. Don't be a draft horse, work with pleasure only. Discard the program when you feel like it, but go back to it the next day. Concentrate, narrow down, exclude. Forget the books you want to write. Think only of the book you are writing. Write first and always. Painting, music, friends, cinema, all these come afterward. I read that and I was like, that could apply to anyone. It was just, it's beautiful and it's one of those things that's worth kind of printing out and and posting. I should post it to to Pinterest. (laughs) No, okay, there it is. Henry Miller Commandments. Awesome. It's it's great. Uh, And so with that, I will say, make sure you find us on Stitcher Smart Radio. Uh, It is there. Stitcher allows you to listen to your favorite shows directly from your iPhone, iPad, Android phone, Kindle Fire, and more on demand and on the go. If you don't have it, you can download it for free at Stitcher.com or find a link to your appropriate app store. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. Uh, So make sure you check that out. And, you know, speaking of Megan, if you're into cause marketing, which you probably should be, let's face it, uh, you need to unleash your inner do-gooder. Megan has a new show. Did you know this? Nope. It's called Cause Talk Radio. And Good for her. Uh, it is available on the Rash Pixel Network, and it's great. It's it's her and her uh, new uh, her new buddy Joe Waters, who's fantastic. I guess you call him a Bostonian. He's a Bostonian. Is that what you call those people if you're from Boston? That's right. He's great. He's got a great uh, Boston accent. They've got a new show, and their first episode is live this week. Uh, so you can find it in iTunes or Stitcher. Just search for uh, uh, either Rash Pixel TV, or um, yeah, and you'll see all the shows. Or Cause Talk Radio will take you right to their first episode. It's worth listening to, and uh, it sounds great. They talk uh, this week. They talk, I believe, about the the new Facebook timeline for brands. Uh, and that's coming in February. We should probably talk about that too. From mm, uh, you know, Facebook. absolutely. Let's Tom put that on coming. the list. Yeah, so that's on the list too. So Pinterest and awesome. Facebook for brands. That's okay. what I got. Where can people find you, Dane Christensen? Uh, do I want them to? Please Prob- go to strike10media.com. Okay, yeah, you should work. You should do that. Okay. Uh, and uh, and otherwise, uh, head over to rashpixel.tv. We're working on a new website and uh, moving. You know, I'm moving things to Squarespace. Man. I'm loving it. I saw, I, I saw a, a link you sent me. That's was a Squarespace. That was link. your fancy new bio. Is a Squarespace. Squarespace. I'm going to move everything over there, and so I'm. It's much more simple. It's. I'm just. I'm going. You know, this was my my thing. It's very simple. Got to go simple. So that's it. I'm done with you. Okay. Bye. Bye.